Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. South Africa's gas cliff came into focus again this week with a warning of a likely day zero in the coming two years. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss these warnings as well as the possible risks associated with some of the proposed solutions. Hi Terence. Hi what is the background to this gas cliff and the day zero warning? You know, gas was never really part of the eco manufacturing economy in South Africa. It was a very small component until we developed this pipeline infrastructure into southern Mozambique. And uh, therefore, there was a, a demand for this gas. I mean, um, manufacturers have, there's a big benefit to having this gas in their processes. So uh, that is now embedded. But with Cecil over a number of years has been saying, look, we're going to try and extend this production profile out of the Panda and Tamano fields, and they've been doing exploration development work. They haven't really found the amount of gas to replace and to keep this production profile. So they've been talking about a tapering for a number of years. But added to this is now Sasol wanting to use much more of the gas itself in the Secunda operations to decarbonize, so to displace coal in its processes. Uh, with gas and it will help it significantly in decarbonizing its business and we know there's a lot of pressure on Sasol to do that. So there's going to be a firm date where Sasol is going to start uh, sort of cutting back on the supply to manufacturing entities, particularly in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal. And that date is really around 2026, which is not far away at all. So there's, there's not only this gas cliff from the lack of uh, exploration success, but there's also this gas, gas cliff, or now day zero, uh, where Cecil says, well, we're not going to be able to supply uh, consumers downstream of us. Which sectors will be affected and what are some of the possible solutions? Well, it's a, a number of uh, sectors in South African economy, you know, Arslong, Mittal, companies like that. Uh, there's glass makers, there's ceramic companies, uh, there's beverage, food and beverage entities that use this gas. So it's used in a number of uh, uh, processes. And some of the um, sort of remedies that have been spoken about for a number of years is really because we haven't had exploration success and any exploration success that we've had domestically has been offshore, uh, the sort of west, south and west coast of South Africa. So that's, there's no infrastructure network there. The only sort of immediate off taker there could be the Petro, so gas to liquids refinery. And anyway, those projects, uh, that those gas farms are really nascent in terms of developing them into, explore, uh, into actual production. So that, that's not a, a feas feasible um, solution. And obviously there's been massive fines up in northern Mozambique, but northern Mozambique, very, very far away from South Africa. There's no pipeline network. So it couldn't tie in immediately into the, the existing tar, uh, pipeline network that has been developed in the south of the country. And we also know that, th that those developments um, have been sort of very badly affected by violence that's broken out in northern Mozambique and projects have been placed on hold for a number of years. We see there's now movement again by Total Energies to restart its LNG project there. So the only real feasible solution is to import gas uh, in the form of LN, uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG. And there's two sort of immediate terminal pr prospects. The one is in Matola uh, in southern Mozambique, in Maputo. Uh, that's being developed by uh, Gigajoule and Total Energies as a partnership there, and that's very advanced. And it's claimed to be technically shovel-ready. And then there's the Richards Bay uh, terminal that we know that the preferred bidder was announced earlier this year uh, between VOPAC and um, Transnet pipelines. But again, that, it's not clear that that project's immediately shovel-ready, as well as um, you know, it needs to get to financial close. So there are those two uh, options for bringing gas into the hinterland of South Africa where the demand is. The issue is the timing mismatch um, between this day zero of 2026, 30 months away, and what <laughs> the manufacturers need immediately in terms of supply. There is a proposal to anchor the LNG imports with gas to power demand. Yes, so to get these projects to financial close, but particularly the Matola one, uh, which is probably the most advanced project, 
there's 40 petajoules that the Gauteng and Kazunu Tolma manufacturers uh, consume is not really seen as sufficient a base load uh, or uh, volumes, volume wise, to, to justify these big, uh, this big LNG terminal in Matola. And there's a view that it should be tagged on to South Africa's gas to power ambitions. Now we know we've, South Africa's got significant gas to power ambitions that are starting to emerge. We've got a, a gas to power RPP program that was launched and bidding has to be in, I think, by August this year. So that is underway and that would be for 2,000 uh, megawatts of mid-merit type supply. And then we know that there's going to be another 1,000 megawatts coming out of Kuka. The Gigajoule uh, project, the Total Energies, they, they said there's also a potential to tag on gas to power project in Matola itself. So you would have uh, gas coming in and part of that gas would immediately go into a gas to power facility. And they're suggesting that South Africa should be open to a cross-border PPA, power purchase agreement. But they wanted it at quite a high ca uh, capacity factor. Then we've got, you know, the, the electricity minister in South Africa noting uh, in his response to the State of the Nation uh, this week uh, that there's also a big gas to power ambitions from Eskom in Richards Bay, 3,000. And he's talking about a base load type profile. So that there's a view there that maybe that would provide the sort of anchor uh, volume wise for sort of what would justify these terminals. Definitely, you know, if there was a, a 3,000 megawatt base load gas, which, uh, uh, which is what is being proposed by Eskom in, um, in Richards Bay, that would definitely require huge amounts of volumes. And again, I think the gigajoule plan is for a fairly high capacity factor, I think a base load type profile in the Matola uh, area and then in, probably not enough demand in Mozambique itself and sending um, electrons over the border. So those, there's that, that sort of proposal that's coming out um, from, from the developers of gas and obviously the manufacturers are very keen on this because they just want to know that there's going to be steady supply and if there's a volume off taker there, a large volume off taker from the power industry and they, they, even though they will be relatively small at this 40 petajoules, it justifies the investments that will mean that there will be steady state gas supply into their facilities at a higher price, you know, that's the thing, you know, this uh, gas that's coming in, even though there's been massive fights around the way Cecil charge, the, 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 the formula that Cecil uses to charge downstream users in South Africa, there's been a lot of unhappiness about that. Even so, this will be a step up in, in, in the price of gas to these manufacturers. Some will not be able to absorb that, but the survey that the Industrial Gas Users Group has done um, suggests that many will be able to absorb it because they'll be able to pass it on to the end consumer. Where you don't have that sort of leverage, it's going to be much more difficult. And they think that there will be continual steady demand at around these 40 petajoules if we can get LNG into the system. What are some of the potential risks to this approach? Well, the big risk is now we've got ourselves into a situation again in South Africa where we're going to have to make a very fast decision around this. And the biggest risk I see is this uh, gas to power anchoring role. Now that's, you know, it's great for <laughs> potentially the manufacturers. It definitely helps with the financial close of these LNG terminals, but it's not necessarily what this, the electricity system needs. You know, all the studies that have been done over the many years, ab apart from the very disputed integrated resource plan, really once, uh, that's the 2023 draft that's currently under alpha co uh, public comment, really wants mid-merit and lower gas profile. So not this sort of big volumes of gas just being pumped, uh, popped into a um, a gas to power facility and then used at a sort of mid merit to higher base light load profile. It really is about using gas uh, in, as a gap filler. As you bring in more variable renewable energy into the system, there will be those windless and uh, mites when there's no solar in the system um, and that you need to really have enough capacity to close those gaps and gas to power is a quick response like battery storage, also some pumped hydro, so a number of flex flexible generators. So that's really how you want to 
have a least cost type profile for electricity. Now, if we in this urgent period where we've got four months ready to make some decisions so that there can be financial close, that so that can be shovels in the ground in time for that 30 month cutoff date, you know, we can make wrong headed decisions or decisions that we don't know the full implications of what it's going to mean for electricity consumers. You know, and ultimately, if you're running baseload gas powered fire stations on imported LNG, it's going to be extremely expensive. It's going to add to the electricity and you know the way the formula currently works there is talk about changing it but basically the consumer will pay so it's not ideal from an electricity sector um, wrong media in the medium term we just need any electricity we can get but in the as we add new variable renewable and at the scale that we should be doing because that's the cheapest electrons that we can get new electrons we can get into the system and as we back it up with things like gas and battery and pumped hydro and whatever, um, this is not the ideal way to use a gas to power fleet and we'll be paying for it because these PPAs are going to be a minimum of 20 years. We'll be paying for it for 20 years. We dodged a bullet when it came to the car power ships uh, and that was going to be extremely expensive. This, because of the urgency, I wonder if whether we're going to dodge the bullet this time. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.